The good news is that all the people in this room are going to live to cross 80 years. So that is the good news. And the good news for all the women is that they're going to live three years longer because women are the genetically stronger species. And if you look at the country, by 30 years from now, one in four people will be old and we will be not a young nation but we will be an old nation and health is absolutely how you experience aging if you have bad health your aging is going to be quite quite a difficult circumstance there are few factors which influence aging one is your own behavior the other one is age related changes affect each one differently and of course, genetics is something that you cannot change. And uh, women by their own nature are the strongest genetic species. So men cannot change that. So that is something which you cannot do. And disease is prone to each one. When you are old, you suffer from non-communicable diseases, which is hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, various kinds of things. This has to be. And then you have to have a special emphasis for older women because they are the ones who are going to grow older and uh, older than the men at least. And then they also need special care. And we have found in our work that older women also suffer from uh, mental trauma and also due to loneliness, all the depression and other things increase in old age for women much more than men because they are not socially connected. Until not so long ago, it was believed that there was something called the mind which was controlling our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors. And then, as a part of the huge amount of advance that has been made in the field of brain research, you heard of a CT scan, you heard of an MRI scan, people came up with what is called an fMRI, a functional MRI scan. What the functional MRI scan was initially used for was that they would they, they put a person inside the scanner and they asked him to think certain thoughts. I mean, they showed some pictures and all. When the person was seeing those pictures, he was asked to describe the thoughts that were going on in, inside his head. And that scanner could see parts of his brain lighting up. Eventually, we realized that the thought part of the brain or the thinking part of the brain or the part of the brain which controls this entire processing of information is a very well-defined structure. So we could identify that there is a part of the brain which controls thinking patterns like there is a part of the brain which controls the movement of my thumb, which controls my vision, my hearing, my taste and so on. Then they, these researchers, they carried it a bit further. They showed people some let's say very frightening scenes, some frightening videos, some frightening pictures. The people reported feeling afraid, anxious. There were other pictures that were shown, they reported feeling other emotions. And in this same fMRI scanner, they found that different parts of the brain were lighting up when people reported feeling certain emotions. So we understood and learned that there is a, there is a distinct part of the brain which controls our emotions, the genesis of emotions or our emotional patterns. And exactly the same thing was done for our behavior patterns. You could ask the person to perform any kind of behavior and there would be a part of the brain which we now call the motor cortex, which would light up each time the person would do something. With this, the transition away from the use of the word mind to the use of the word brain, it, it, that transition ha started happening faster. And today we have reached a stage where everything that is happening in the brain can be understood in terms of the nerve cells 
or the neurons that are present in the brain. Neuroplasticity is a term that describes the ability of the brain to retain any change that we cause the brain to do. I start learning Spanish. There are neurons or nerve cells inside my brain. They start to fire. The difference between the brain and the muscle, as we realize now, is that the brain is a dynamic organ. It's not a static organ. We have the ability to cause the formation of new nerve cells. It's a radical change in our understanding. So when you start focusing on a task, the number of nerve cells, it starts to increase. The connections or the synapses between the nerve cells, they start to increase. And the primary law of neuroplasticity is that neurons that fire together, wire together. The more you do something, the thicker those wires become. How do they become thicker? There are new nerve cells formed, there are new synapses formed, and the connections, the synaptic connections keep getting stronger and stronger. Why it is important for me as a psychiatrist to understand this, you know, specific emphasis on dementia, Alzheimer's, other age-related problems, there is nothing that we cannot slow down. There are a lot of things that we can re reverse, by understanding the principles of neuroplasticity. So like I said, the first law of neuroplasticity is neurons that fire together, fire together. The second law which is equally important is if you don't use it, you lose it. So what is happening in a condition, let's say like Alzheimer's, which is a kind of dementia or in Parkinsonism or any of these old age degenerative disorders is that there are cells inside the brain that start to die out. A person has dementia, his memory function starts to get impacted. Because the memory function is impacted, it causes him to use the memory function less and less. But the moment the person starts putting in lesser effort, through this principle of if you don't use it, you lose it, you start to accelerate the process of greater loss of neurons, which worsens your dementia and you're caught in a vicious cycle. Till 10 years back, I would get people and I would say, okay, let's do exercises, solve puzzles, etc., etc. Today, there are wonderful treatments available, which are administered through machines, which, where we can actually stimulate the formation of new nerve cells through a lot of different techniques like magnetic stimulation, use of direct current, use of light, use of infrared light alternating current. There's something called random noise stimulation. So there are these wonderful advances that have taken place. I want to be reasonably healthy, at least here, at the, when I hit 75, 78, 80 years of age. How can I do it? Do I need to get despondent? Do I need to feel hopeless? Just because today I find a lot of morbidity in, in the older age population? No. I'm sure that within the next few years, we are going to come up with a lot of interventions which are going to help us promote a brain reserve, a brain capacity and a brain functioning. Like every organism in the world, but we understand the human brain much better, most organisms probably do not have a developed brain. The human brain wants to stay in a state of equilibrium. As a psychiatrist today, I do not use these terms like, oh, you have an anxiety disorder, you have depression. I understand or I conceptualize things for myself only in these concepts. In terms of equilibrium, homeostasis, resilience, inadequate resilience. And if, if we talk about something like dementia or Alzheimer's, you talk about neurological disorders. Essentially, in all of those, it is the resilience which starts to weaken. And that allows all these other factors which are having an impact to start overcoming the resilience further. And today, whatever treatments that scientists like me are working on, those, all those treatments, what are they trying to do? Eventually, they are trying to boost the resilience so that this disequilibrium which has been caused, we can slowly start to reverse it to whatever extent possible. The closer you come to the midline, the healthier you get. And the healthier you get, the lesser the impact of whatever morbidity it is that is impacting you. The future of the psychological clinic or the psych clinic lies in psychoeducation, lies in building awareness, lies in putting well-being at the heart of education 
and I do know for sure that there are many people from the field of education and, and I implore you to please consider bringing well-being and bringing, putting well-being at the heart of education because we focus so much on the, the skill set uh, of math and science and history and everything else but we have to start investing right now in well-being. Very simple things like connecting, being curious, being a learner, giving. I think the fears have also taken away from us the ability to really give freely, which is something that we need to learn and, and, and get back in our lives. So some of these things I wanted to flag to all of us. And, and last but not the least, you really don't have to be experts. I mean, all of us are speaking from our spaces, but I think everybody really pointed out one thing that reaching out, social connection, being there for someone, you know, just a few kind words, it just helps in the social support and it actually slows the aging. Having a passion is important. Having a purpose is even more important. It gives us a direction and purpose has the sense of, you know, encompassing more than just your own self. So go ahead and make a difference and the future of the psych clinic lies in connection. We can learn and know more about the advances. We definitely, the, the technology, we definitely need policies, but every single person in this room can make that difference.